Our first presenter today is Professor Talis Budnins, who is a professor of finance at the UTS Business School, who will present roughly 15 to 20 minutes, which will be followed by five minutes questions for Professor Budnins. Afterwards, we continue with Professor Warren Hogan, who will similarly present uh, just under 20 minutes to then be followed by five minutes questions for him. And we finish up with a Q&A. Okay, thank you, Ger Gerhard, and uh, a warm welcome to everyone. I'm going to be talking about stock markets and how stock markets have behaved during the, the, the COVID pandemic and what we can make of those stock market reactions. What can we read from the stock market movements? So the first part that I'll cover will be about market dynamics, just having a look at what's happening in markets around the world before we start digging into the interpretations of those dynamics. So here I have a, a plot of global stock markets since the beginning of the year. So since uh, 1st of January, 2020. And, and the striking feature that you can see uh, across these several examples of, of global stock markets is that they're all moving in tandem. So despite substantial differences across these different countries, US, Japan, Germany, Australia, UK, in how the governments have responded to the pandemic, uh, the economic policies that have been introduced, and also the differences in the infection rates and death rates, the markets seem to be moving as one. This is a global problem and the markets are treating it as if we're all in this together. So that also means that analyzing any one of these markets is uh, going to be fairly representative of what's happening globally across a large number of markets. So I'm now going to break it up into three phases. I'm going to talk about the build-up, uh, what markets looked like in the lead up to the pandemic, the crash, and then what we've been seeing in the most recent two months up until uh, today. So first, the build-up. The starting point of, of where we entered the year was that we were at the end of the longest bull market on record. So here I've got a, a diagram showing stock market uh, movements back uh, 120 years. And the striking feature is that this last run, this bull market run, has basically taken us from the GFC through to the end of, end of last year. As a result of this extremely strong bull market run, Stock market valuations uh, were also at record highs leading into the pandemic. So the, the price to uh, earnings ratios uh, with a few adjustments were at levels that really, really we've only seen on two other occasions historically. One was during the dot-com bubble of, of, of 2000, and we know how that ended. And then the second period in history where we've seen these types of valuations was uh, immediately preceding the Great Depression. So equity markets were extremely hot, extremely high valuations going into this crisis. We also saw that the yield curves were, the yield curve um, in the US in particular and in some other uh, currencies as well, was inverting, which is typically a sign of trouble up ahead. Uh, yet the markets hadn't uh, responded to that yield curve um, inversion. So from many regards, this looked like, from the equities markets looked like a ticking time bomb that was simply waiting for a catalyst. There were many sort of market commentators at the time saying, how do we make sense of this? Then the catalyst arrives and boy, did it arrive. It was quick, bad information. So the, uh, the market sort of peaked around late Feb. And if we just take the US market as an example, we saw a 35% decline in the market in the space of a month an extremely rapid fall with a huge amount of volatility. The market was hitting market-wide circuit breakers um, on a number of occasions, which is actually quite a rare thing for a market to do, to have such extreme price movements uh, on a daily basis. So here's a plot of the volatility. What we can see is that volatility uh, spiked tremendously. In fact, it hit levels that were equal or even slightly higher than the levels that we saw during the global financial crisis of uh, 2009. So extreme volatility. Then from late March or mid-March comes a very strong rebound in markets. Okay, so if you measure the price movements in the US from 23, 23rd of March to today, U.S. markets have rebounded by about 32%. And it's, it's, it's a fairly similar number in Australia, a little bit less, but a very, very strong rebound um, in any case. Now, that's happened in the space of two months. What this does is this takes the stock markets back to valuations that we last saw in October 2009. And so you think about historically where, what that implies, 
It means markets are back to where they were sort of immediately prior to COVID breaking out in China. We're back where we came from. It's as if this whole thing never happened. Okay, what's really puzzling about this strong rebound or, or bounce, and I'll discuss how to interpret this, is that this came at a time of a flow of really bad economic news. So just one example of uh, an announcement by the IMF. IMF was talking about us heading into the worst recession since the, the Great Depression, and it's going to be far worse than the GFC. Okay, that's the sort of news that's flowing out while the market is rising 32%. So a number of sort of market commentators have looked at this and you know, come to the conclusion that the market simply seems disconnected from reality, that the stock market seems to be ignoring the economy. Okay? So puzzling dynamics in stock markets, uh, to put it lightly. The question is how to make sense of this. So does this strong rebound in the, in the stock market mean that we're headed for a strong economic rebound? Can we expect a V-shaped recovery? Or is the market response somehow fooling us about uh, the, the economic uh, prognosis going forward? Were stocks overvalued to begin with going into this uh, crisis after this 12-year uh, bull market? Why didn't the market correct earlier? Why do we have to wait for a pandemic like this to see the correction? And sort of the more general question is, what drives the market movements? Are they efficient? Are they linked to economic outcomes? So can we read information about the future of the economy from what the stock markets are doing. These are the issues I want, I want to tackle. And how I'm going to tackle these issues is by pointing out what I think are three important considerations for trying to read these stock market reactions. And these three considerations come from three recent research studies uh, that together with some co-authors we've been working on. So the first one is, is about market efficiency. We know markets are good at forecasting in many, many contexts. They give very strong, often very accurate, forward-looking predictions of what's going to happen in the future. But it's important to understand the subtleties of the different types of market efficiency and when markets can be efficient and when they can show signs of inefficiency. What we do in this study is we split it up into, we split market efficiency into two sort of flavors or types. One is micro level efficiency, which is all about how efficiently is one stock priced relative to another. It's all about relative prices within the stock market. So for example, is A and Z correctly priced relative to BHP? Is one too cheap and the other's too expensive? So if you were to construct a long short uh, position, long one short the other, can you make a bet on how that long short position is going to play out in terms of future returns? Okay, if you can predict those future returns from that long short portfolio, the market's not particularly efficient in a micro sense. The related concept is micro level informativeness of prices. So do stocks with higher valuations, like for example, a stock with a high PE ratio than compared to another stock, is that a good predictor of the fact that the higher valued stock is going to have stronger earnings in the future? Okay, so do stock valuations tell you something about the strength of earnings in the future, the fundamentals in other words? Contrast that micro level efficiency with macro efficiency. And now here I'm talking about the efficiency of absolute stock prices, so market-wide valuations. So is the market as a whole overvalued, undervalued, or is it correctly valued? Can you take the current market-wide valuation ratios, compare them to historic averages of those ratios, and use that to predict the future market return? If the, if the valuations are high, does that predict low future returns and vice versa? Okay, so if it does, there's a degree of inefficiency at the market-wide level. The related concept is market-wide informativeness, which is, does the current valuation level of the stock market or the stock market return give you a signal about the future market-wide earnings or the future economic activity? That would be the case if you had a highly informative market at the macro level. So we've got started a number of measures of these various concepts, but let me get into the evidence what we find is that markets are far more efficient at the micro level, that is in relative pricing, than they are at the macro level, that is the absolute market-wide valuation levels. So you can see that in, in the, the plot here on the left-hand side, uh, the top curve is through time for the US stock markets, the degree of micro efficiency, that is efficiency of relative prices. And then we see in the, more, the, the darker line here, the degree of macro efficiency. And so you can see that micro efficiency is much higher than, than macro efficiency. And this is consistent with Samuelson's dictum. Paul Samuelson predicted this type of an effect uh, 
already a long time ago. It's just remained largely untested until, until these recent studies. The other observation here is that the wedge between the micro-efficiency and the macro-efficiency is getting more pronounced. It's getting larger. In other words, stock markets are getting better and better at pricing stocks relative to one another, but worse at setting market-wide valuations at levels that correlate with future economic activity. In other words, the markets are becoming decoupled from the economy is what we're, sh what we're finding in uh, these kind of long time series analysis, these two types of efficiency. Now we find that there's a number of drivers of this. The rise of passive investing has driven this decline or this decoupling of stock markets with the economy. So has the rise of delegated funds management in particular sort of rigid asset allocations like 60, 40 portfolios that hold 60% equities, 40% fixed income. To give you an illustration, what does such a portfolio do? Well, when the markets crash, the equity value in that portfolio has declined. So a fund with such a asset allocation will mechanically be forced to buy the stock market, irrespective of the future economic outlooks. Okay, so you get these bounces in markets that are unrelated to fundamentals as a result of this type of uh, investment management. So a couple of the implications from this. Number one is it explains why markets are very efficient in one sense, in the sense that you know, relative pricing is really accurate. So fund managers find it hard to beat the market, that is to generate alpha. But at the same time, market-wide valuations often seem uh, uh, uncoupled from the actual economy. So you get this low degree of macro efficiency. From an investment perspective, it sort of implies that it's going to be difficult to really gain a lot of value from stock picking, but there is potentially a fair bit of value to be added to a portfolio from strategic dynamic asset allocation that takes into consideration the market-wide valuations. The second consideration is what I'm going to refer to as post-traumatic stress disorder or the PTSD of markets. So consider the following effects. When you walk from outside where it's sunny into a poorly lit room, that room will seem really dark at first. But then after a while, once you adapt to the level of lighting in that room, it actually won't seem that dark. It'll seem quite reasonable. Okay. Take another example. When you stare at a red screen, for an extended period of time, and you should try this after the, the webinar. Once you look at a piece of white paper afterwards, that white paper will appear to have a greenish tinge to it. Yeah, and then eventually that green will disappear and you see white again. So these are both examples of perceptual biases that happen once a human is shifted away from an environment of a very strong stimulus into a more normal environment. Okay, that perceptual bias lasts until perceptions until until perceptions adapt to the environment and perceptions catch up with reality. Okay, so this effect is known as habituation or neuronal adaptation, depending on which field uh, you're looking at. Now, what does this mean for markets? Well, we test the effects of this in financial markets in two settings. First, we do lab experiments. We take people through trading simulations where we can control the level of risk and volatility, and we observe their perceptions of risk. The second is we look at the pricing of S&P 500 options and infer how implied volatility relates to future volatility to look for these distortions. The key result that comes out of our studies is that people have a tendency to underestimate risk following periods of very high volatility. Okay, So when you drop off from an extreme level of volatility to a normal level of volatility, people feel like the environment is safer than it actually is. Now, how that's relevant to understanding what's happening today Thomas, is that- You have five minutes. Thank you. We've just dropped off from a period of extreme volatility. Remember, VIX was at those all-time highs. And we've just backed down a bit into a period which is still highly elevated, but is no longer as extreme as it was uh, a couple of months ago. So traders are saying, you know, thank God we're back to normal, which is just an example of, of the bias because we're actually not back to normal. We are at a level that is much higher in terms of risk and uncertainty than historical averages. Now, what does that do, this effect? What, what was the implication of that? Well, the implication is that following extreme volatility, as people underestimate risk, that's going to appear as excessive optimism. Okay, so this effect is driven by, you know, a deep-rooted neurobiological adaptation to the high-risk environment. But what it means is that when you underestimate risk, you underestimate the discount rates that are required, which means you inflate the valuations. Okay, you can think about that simply through a discounted uh, cash flows model. What that means is markets will bounce following extreme volatility, 
until perceptions catch up with reality. Once the perceptions catch up with reality, the discount rates adjust, the valuations come back towards fundamentals. So this is an effect that we found evidence for in the lab and in, and in field studies that is likely to explain some of the bounce in markets lately. The third major consideration is shifting away from free markets to what I call Fed markets. Okay, so we've heard the US Federal Reserve say, you know, we'll take everything, it, we'll, we'll do everything it takes to stop this. Um, RBA has echoed that sentiment and said, we'll transact in whatever quantities are necessary to achieve this objective. So these days, the biggest market participant is not a hedge fund, it's the central bank. So we've got the Fed, the ECB, the RBA, Bank of Japan, Bank of England, all intervening in markets. So here's a plot of what the US Fed's balance sheet looks like from the point where they really started quantitative easing, which was in response to the global financial crisis. Since that point, they've got the, the hang of intervening in markets and the, ba the balance sheet of the, of the Fed has expanded even though it's gone through some periods of, of contraction. I've overlaid on this plot the S&P 500 index and visually you should already be able to see that there's a link between the two here, okay? Now, if you zoom into this most recent period, what happens is just as the markets crash, the Fed expands its balance sheet enormously, okay? And markets recover uh, in response to that. The Fed asset purchases have been, you know, at an unprecedented rate. The, the balance sheet has gone from $4 trillion to about $7 trillion in the space of three months, or sorry, rather in, you know, about one month, to be honest. That's 33% of GDP. So compared to other quantitative easing programs, the, the speed, the pace of this expansion and the magnitude just makes the other quantitative easing look like it was negligible. Now, what does this do for markets? Here's some very early stage analysis of what this does to stock markets. So the lead lag correlations between Fed balance sheet expansion and stock market movements suggests that when markets decline, that tends to be followed by strong balance sheet expansion by the US Fed. That expansion happens you know, in, the, in the space of two to five weeks after the strong market decline. Subsequently, that borrowing, uh, sorry, that uh, asset purchase activity by the Fed tends to precede market rebounds by the space of about zero to three weeks, okay? Now these correlations are very strong, but if we start modeling this a little bit more formally in a time series model that captures these lead lag uh, causations between the, the two actors, we can actually construct a counterfactual, which I think is quite interesting, which is what would market prices look like had the Fed not intervened, okay? So I construct a time series model that models these two things and um, what this model tells us is once, the, once you get a shock to the, to the Fed's balance sheet, the market response takes about eight weeks to play out. This is the stock market response. One minute, tell us. Plays out at a substantial magnitude. You end up with a, a decent fraction of the total balance sheet expansion being reflected in stock prices. If we take the Fed's asset purchases in March and translate them according to this model as to what the impact, the estimated impact of that is on the S&P 500, it's about a 13% increase in the S&P 500. Now contrast that with the actual movement of the S&P 500 of 32% since it's low. This is telling us that the Fed's actions in and of themselves explain over a third of this bounce in stock markets, US stock markets. And if you overlay the Australian market reactions and, uh, uh, and the US market reactions, and you have a look at the point where the Fed really stepped in, two things happen at that point. One is the markets turn, they spring back. And the second is from that point onwards, there's a disconnect between the US market and the, and, and the Australian market. Okay, consistent with the notion that Consistent with the motion, with, with the notion that the that the U.S. Federal Reserve's actions had a major impact on the stock market. Now, let's just bring this all together into sort of one last slide that considers uh, what we can read from the current market reactions. Number one takeaway is that the stock markets are increasingly decoupled from future economic conditions, and there's a number of factors that are driving that decoupling. Okay, including passive investing, delegated funds management, static asset allocations, and so forth. Okay, so this means just in general, 
there's not too much to read from the stock market movement if you're trying to predict future economic uh, outcomes. The second important consideration is that following extreme volatility, risk tends to be underestimated, which then looks like excessive optimism. It leads to inflated valuations and market bounces until perceptions have a time to adjust to the new environment and catch up with reality. Okay? So what that implies is that strong market recovery doesn't imply strong economic recovery. And the last effect that was relevant here is that central banks are now playing a major role in setting overall market price levels. And so central bank actions contribute to rebounds in stock markets precisely at the time when the economic outlook is looking gloomy. But the caution really here is that balance sheet expansion cannot continue indefinitely. Okay, so the bottom line is that I do not interpret these market rebounds as an indication that the economy is back on track for a quick recovery. The sort of the final thing that I'll close off on here is if we think about where markets are headed, uh, I'm not in the industry of predicting market movements and I can't tell you with a high degree of certainty where the market will be at the end of the year. But if you think about these three effects, there's three different factors at least that distort stock markets from fundamentals. It just so happens that all three factors at this point in time happen to be pushing in one direction and that is to keep the market propped up. So if you think about something that is fundamentally being propped up and now think about the amount of downside risk that's on the table compared to upside potential, it looks to me that on the balance of probabilities, there's more downside risk than there is upside potential from this point onwards, because it only takes any one of these propping devices to fail or attenuate and the market could come back down towards fundamentals. So on that note, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Talis. Uh, and boy, that horse doesn't look really good. But we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one is from attendee Nancy, who says, uh, five major companies, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, etc., in the US control 20% of US stocks. They all saw increase in revenue. For example, Amazon recorded 17% increase in revenue in the last quarter. My question is, what role do these companies play in determining the stock price and affect the market? World debt in the last quarter is 17 trillion, whereas last year the world debt was 8 trillion. How will this debt affect the market in post-COVID? Very good question. It's, uh, it's a very good observation that the markets are highly concentrated, in, in particular US markets, uh, driven by a small number of extremely large companies. That is yet another factor that wasn't sort of part of uh, what I discussed that drives this disconnect between stock market movements and the economy. If you think about who, in terms of companies, who's been the hardest hit by the COVID pandemic, it's not the largest companies. It's not necessarily the tech companies that are driving the US stock markets. It's the small, small and medium enterprises. Um, so that's another reason why stock market movements aren't really reflecting the broader economy. Now, the huge amounts of debt, I view them uh, in particular sort of on, on government balance sheets. I view them as similar to Fed balance sheet expansion. You can't keep expanding government debt, nor can you keep expanding uh, Fed balance sheets indefinitely as a proportion of GDP. So the fact that these levels are very high at the moment gives us less room to expand that fiscal or monetary spending in the future. And while it's unlikely that governments will sort of clamp back on the fiscal stimulus and, and central banks will clamp back on the monetary stimulus in a uh, very rapid manner that causes a decline in a sharp decline in markets, if they have to unwind these positions over a longer period of time, that simply means a dampening force, dampening force, dampening force on economic activity and on stock markets, which um, really doesn't look good for long-term uh, returns, long-run returns on stock markets. But then again, long-run returns on fixed income are also not really all that good at the moment. One other question was, what are potential factors driving the underestimation of risk in such circumstances? So the underestimation of risk, um, from the evidence that we have in testing these effects in the laboratory and then, and then checking the field or the empirical evidence, is the sort of deep, um, deep ingrained neurobiological biases that people have. Once you become immersed in an environment with very high stimulus, you become desensitized to it. So take an example of, you know, traders in a market where on a given day, the market can move 7%, sort of unprecedented uh, movements. 
after a while of operating in such a high risk environment where you have millions uh, of dollars on the line every day, you become somewhat desensitized to that risk. Now, once the risk jumps back down towards um, a elevated but closer to normal level, that seems like calm to a, to a trader that's been operating in an extremely high risk environment. And so that's what triggers this underestimation of the risk. That these days, even though we've got a high degree of uncertainty about earnings going forward and economic conditions, it just feels so much calmer compared to where we were in March. And that's, the, that's one of the drivers of the underestimation of risk post uh, extreme volatility. Thales, um, another question for you while we're on. Um, are, you, are your findings consistent with a correlation between implied volatility and historical volatility? One of our guests, Alan, says that he recalls earlier analysis showing realized option payouts are less than those implied by, by market prices. For example, future actual volatility is less than implied volatility. Could you comment on that, Thales? Sure. So I think perhaps what the question is uh, uh, relating to is the variance risk premium, that um, there tends to be a, a gap between implied volatility and realized volatility, uh, which is explained by the, the variance risk premium of people willing to pay to hedge uh, the possibility of, of spikes in, in volatility. Um, implied volatility from the empirical analysis that we've done closely tracks realized volatility. Um, it's a forward-looking measure, of course, and realized volatility is backward-looking, but the future expectations of volatility are heavily driven by current levels of volatility. And one of the reasons is that volatility is a highly persistent variable. Uh, the current level of volatility is a good predictor of the future. And so this is in fact one of the, one of the um, empirical facts that we exploit to be able to identify distortions in risk perceptions in uh, US markets in the field. So this is how we do our empirical version of the lab experiments that we've been running. And it's in those types of tests that we can see systematic distortions in implied volatility compared to future realized volatility at particular times. And those particular times typically are when you come, come back down from a very high volatility level. It's at those points in time that even highly sophisticated and liquid markets like the US S&P 500 options market shows these distortions in implied volatility of how people are pricing volatility at those points. Thank you, Talis. And we're trying now something that we haven't tried before. We're having uh, Warren Hogan on speaker, and I'm trying to get it that way done. All right, great. All right. So following up from Talis, I just want to run through a very quick update on the economic story with a focus here on Australia and, and really to talk you know, about why what the market's essentially pricing, which is some sort of a, a V-shaped recovery in the economy, while it's not um, an unlikely or um, improbable scenario, it's not the only one. And uh, I think in the spirit of uh, looking at risk return, in the spirit of risk management, I think it's worth thinking about what could sort of go wrong. So um, to start with, I think here's some timeline, timelines for Australia, and we are probably the most optimistic uh, of the big countries around the world in the sense that we have uh, had a very great success in dealing with the health crisis, we're now easing, and the, the you know it's, it's, you can really feel the, the shift here in Australia. Um, and look, with the vaccine, maybe we'll even get international borders open next year. So that baseline scenario is, from a health perspective, consistent with the V shape, which of course is probably partly driving these strong moves up in equities in recent times. I think there's a risk scenario to the health one, and that is a second wave. Obviously, none of us want to see that, but it's um, a real risk given we don't know much about it. And I think if we got that, that would definitely be part of the case for a V. But all of the economic analysis I'm going to go through over the next five to uh, 10 to 15 minutes is going to be all based on the baseline health scenario. And that is that we continue to see um, the virus contained and we continue to see the economy open up. So it's based on a pretty good outcome there. A few comments quickly. Next slide, sorry, Gihard. Um, expectations. Uh, just really, from my experience, expectations, um, you know, there's a few things to note which are relevant to this period of radical uncertainty, to steal the term from Mervyn King, um, who just published a book on this. Um, is First of all, most expectations about the future are based on today. It's a projection board of today, and there's lots of reasons why that would be a sensible thing. Most of all, it, the world changes slowly, so we're looking for big changes and been successful for human beings for thousands of years. 
The other thing is we don't know the model. So to try and forecast, um, you need to understand the world. And quite frankly, as a macroeconomist, I can tell you that we don't know the model. Um, uh, so that's one thing, uh, extrapolative expectations. The other one is um, for experts who do, who do have models and, and try and make sense of the future, people like myself, um, the estimation of those models are essentially an exercise in mean reversion. Um, so I think that's important to understand that a lot of models really just take you back to what history says is an average or something like that. Not all models, but macroeconomic models tend to have that kind of outcome. Another thing to bear in mind is people are inherently optimistic. Obviously, this is delving into the psychology of it, but we won't take a 50-50 bet. We're risk averse. And why do we even get out of bed in the morning is Keynes is animal spirits. So we are inherently optimistic. So when you mix all that up, I think you can to, you know see what's happening is that a great sort of bunching is occurring where you've got people who are essentially saying we're going to go back to some idea of normality over the next year or two the so-called V-shapers, or you get the people like Rubini, which is the extreme that we're going to have an L-shaped recovery and that's this, you know, what's going on now will stay the same and everything terrible will happen and we're not going to have any recovery. I think the reality is somewhere in between, as it often is, and that I think it'll look a bit like a W, particularly here in Australia, and I just want to go through what that means. So next slide, uh, Gearhart, um, is this is GDP simulations that I've put together for Australia. So one is the level of GDP quarterly from March 2019. The first red bar is um, March this year, so the first sort of last of the so-called normal quarters. Then we have the big shock, uh, and we go right through quarterly to, to the end of 22, December quarter 22. But then we, the second chart is quarterly percentage change. The final one is year on year. So this is the V-shape. So a few things that are interesting here. One is um, the profile of recovery is consistent. This is sort of essentially, I think in terms of Australia, the best way to think about it is the RBA set of forecasts. And I think they basically have GDP returning to its pre-crisis level at the end of 21. Um, a lot of the bank forecasts that came out with their, their results uh, look pretty similar. I want to just note one thing here. The lost output um, compared to March 2020 um, in 2020, this year, the three quarters of this year that are impacted, you lose $104 billion of output. So, bear in mind, we have quarterly output in Australia of just under $500 billion measured in seasonally adjusted chain volume terms from the ABS. And then next year, you only have 41 of lost output. And the total to the end of 22 is 95. So, you actually get some payback in 2022 under the V-shape. The dotted line on the first chart is potential growth of uh, 2% a year. Um, I don't think it's that relevant to this, but it's obviously a key concept for macroeconomists in terms of lost output. Now, those losses are important for a range of reasons. One, I'm going to compare to the W now. But two, it's also this lost income in the economy is important because this is the losses out there that are real. The uh, debt is, 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 is there's leverage against this income. People have to pay uh, mortgages. They have to pay business loans. Um, these are real losses that are going through the economy. So the next slide, Gearhart, is the W-shape um, scenario. And essentially what I have here is obviously a very similar decline in Q2 um, and then a bounce back in Q3, but then softness for the following couple of quarters. And that's it's not really that much of a W. You can see a W a little bit on the GDP year on year on the third chart. Um, but really the idea here is that we have a snapback due to the, the raising restrictions, but then we have recession dynamics that's playing out and keep the economy weak right through to the end of this year into 2021. And then if you look at the lost output data in the, in the table in the top, that's the key is that you have a similar lost output in 2020, but you have much more in 21. So that's why the speed of the recovery is important. Um, and we're sitting right now at the start of the snapback or the, the start of the V. And as we sit here now for markets, for commentators, for the community, it looks like a V. And what I'm arguing is the V will be truncated come September, December, the second half of this year, by the realities of the recession dynamics that have been released on this economy. And that's what I want to quickly touch on now. So if we go to the next slide. This is the loss of jobs. Uh, according to the ABS payroll, um, experimental payroll series, 
It's broad based. All industries except for finance and insurance services have lost substantial jobs uh, over the seven weeks of the, of the lockdown. This is to the second of May. I think there will actually be a few more through to the middle of May before people start going to back to work now as these industries restrict. What I'm looking for here is the idea of is the concept of idle labour. So if you look in the table in the bottom right, you have how many unemployed there were at the start of this, 700,000 as measured by the ABS. I think, I think you're going to get 1.1 million job losses. You're talking about a million on job seeker, a new job seeker application. A lot of people don't go straight to job seeker. They pull out. I'm calling it 1-1. The ABS, I think, will measure it at about 900 when all is said and done. Um, but that's the number, ballpark of outright job losses as represented by that chart from the ABS there on the left. Uh, then you've got JobKeeper, which we now know is 3.5, not 6 million people. And that's what I call insecure labour. So you're either out of a job or you're on JobKeeper. And the key is part of those people on JobKeeper aren't even working, whether they're Qantas pilots um, or they're working for a restaurant worker. Um, and some of them are obviously working and a lot of them are working and they're subsidised. And the key is of that pool of insecure labour, how many people are back at work once the government support is pulled out of the economy towards the end of the year? And I think that you're going to find that we're not going to snap back on that labour pool. I don't think you, obviously, you know, you're not going to lose all those job keeper jobs, but we've already seen a million jobs lost. Some of, the, some of those will come back, but not many. Most of the people who will snap back as the economy reopens will be on job keeper. Um, but then there'll be job keeper losses. People are on it that when it goes, they will be let go because the businesses can no longer afford to hold on to that labour unsubsidised. So that's the idea of idle labour. Next chart, I've mapped this out in a scenario from the past two recessions Australia's experienced, substantial recessions, 90 and 81. So I've indexed that to the peak in employment. Um, I've got the current scenario from March 20, um, and then I've been two scenarios for the V and the W um, going forward for this current cycle. So a couple of things to note on this chart is that in a typical recession, 81 and 90, employment falls by about 3.5% from the peak to the trough, and that takes 15 months. So employment's a lagging indicator. It's one of the reasons this cycle is very different to past cycles, is that the employment hit has come early, and we may well hit the trough early, but the trough is going to be well below uh, past troughs, i.e. just in the month of April alone, the ABS reported a 4.5% drop in employment, i.e. the loss of 600,000 jobs. I think that'll deteriorate for one more month in, in May, and then we'll start to get the reopening recovery. Now, the key, though, for the W versus the V, the weaker scenario, is that you don't get that recovery being maintained right through the period over the year ahead. You actually get some give back of jobs, as I said, as JobKeeper finishes, as, you know, demand, you know, the government supports in the economy start to come out, you see a re-weakening of employment. And, of course, really the V-shaped scenario tells you that this, this downturn from a labour market point of view will be short and sharp, but we'll actually get back quicker, whereas the W scenario says we'll, we'll get back, but it's going to look more like a historical recession. Now, the V-shapers will argue that there's a lot of policy stimulus in there, which you didn't have in 81 or in 90, um, and that's going to prop the economy up. I will argue that the nature of this shock and the substance of it will mean that there will be sort of further, you know, softness in the labour market, that we could, this is going to take time to play out. So the first one here, this chart on the next one, yeah, slide. Five minutes, Warren, five minutes, please. Okay, slide eight. Um, look, it's a lot of detail, but basically what I'm showing is that through the huge government supports, JobKeeper, the expansion of JobSeeker, the, the increased pension payments and other social security payments, that the, the impact on household income in this current period is pretty minimal, even though we've had a lot of lost jobs. JobKeeper is keeping private sector wage bill up because JobKeeper is counted as private sector, so that actually is irrelevant whether there's six or three and a half million from this sort of schematic. The idea here is that the loss of income into the household sector from, from private sector wages is offset by the increase in social security largely. I mean, these are, this is indicative. It's just to show that the government policy is huge and it's offsetting a lot of the private sector pain. Um, but then if you 
wind all these programs down as planned in the end of September, you're going to get the, the, the social security winding down, but you'll still see weakness in private wages. In fact, I think you will see, from what I'm hearing from employers and from what we're seeing in the economy, is that once the subsidy goes, a lot of those jobs will go. The employers won't be able to continue to afford them. So that's the big uncertainty. I'm suggesting that you will see further job losses in Q4, and that's going to be when the shock, you know, the household income shock will really happen um, is later in the year. So that's a reason to be concerned about growth towards the end of the year as the government policy comes off. Next slide. But just quickly, consumer confidence has been hit. It's bouncing back strongly, and that makes sense given the government support. But then on the right side, business confidence has been hit. It's actually, I haven't got the chart going all the way back to 91, but it's well below recession levels, whereas consumer confidence is at recession levels. Um, it's early days, but I think there's going to be a, a, a soft patch in business investment later in the year, whether that's construction program, projects which have been cancelled or the fact that businesses for this period right now are just putting everything on hold. That shows up as current investment projects finish up, there's no new projects coming through the pipeline. So the business impact, Business investment impacts of this are later in the year. Next slide. Look, I won't go into this in detail, but just to say that we have a lot of vulnerable companies. I've talked about this before around the so-called zombie firm. We aren't we aren't seeing bankruptcy rates in the last seven or eight years in Australia grow at their historical pace. And then it's all about whether there's going to be a big rush of insolvencies. We've seen on slide 11, Gearhard, Bank impairment charges. This is the APRA data. I put an estimate in given bank reporting for Q1. That's picked up. It's still well below GFC levels. If we go to the next slide, the idea here is that banks have got a lot of capital, the stock, but the flow is weakened. Bank profits as a percentage of GDP, which is their first line of defence, um, is a lot lower than it was. And so, look, this is a critical issue. We're going to learn more about but the monitoria sort of delays the rec day of reckoning on this down towards the end of the year. So all of this issue around banks and, the, and the, whether they pull the line on businesses will happen post the monitoria, which finishes in September globally um, and here in Australia. And banks have a, le a smaller buffer in profitability, and so they, that might have an impact on their ability to land. Finally, just quickly, I'll finish off with um, on China. Um, Compared to 2009, where they had a lot of traditional stimulus in the wake of the GFC, they're going to be. They've already said with the National People's Congress that it's going to be a different sort of strategy and structure. They've abandoned their GDP target. They're looking at a much more sort of uh, complex array of issues they're dealing with their stimulus. The stimulus packages announced so far in China are a lot less than the GFC. So Australia is not going to get that same kick. But you can say globally, China is not going to play the same role as it did. And obviously, you can add in the geopolitical tensions. Finally, just in terms of equity markets, Talis covered it. But from my point of view, basically, monetary policy is what's driving the overall market uh, valuations because you're seeing um, not just the effect of zero rates making cash unattractive. Um, you've got huge declines um, in long-term rates, which is mucking around with discount factors. So essentially, when you've got... Um, very little alternative and your discount rate falls, you can stretch your equity valuation and that's what we're seeing with PE ratios. So typically in a downturn of any sort, particularly a big one like this, the equity the equity valuation disappear. Um, they actually go from being expensive to cheap because everyone sort of runs for the hills. That's, exact, that's the opposite of what's happening. We saw a little bit of that in March. The market was dysfunctional, but people are actually flocking back into equities because they don't have a lot of other options and they're believing in the V-shape. I'll just finish off quickly with the V-shape recovery is critical to equities and I think the big reason is is with long-term interest rates, the discount rate falling, the value of longer-term cash flows relatively increases and gives the equity market a greater capacity to look for, through a short-term shock to earnings. So they really are betting on a V-shape. If there's any question mark put on those longer term earnings, I think that's when the equity market will be sort of subject to the next round of re-rating. Bearing in mind, even though it's recovered, it still has re-rated somewhat, even though it's looking quite expensive by historical terms. But I think if we if we see the W dynamics play out in Australia, if you see a slower recovery overseas, that's I think when the market will start to get a bit wobbly once again. 
and valuations may even uh, cheap up a little bit. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I hope that went across all right. Thank you very much, Warren. And I have a, a question directly for you uh, with respect to the last slide. With Australia, Chinese tension rising and China imposing trade restrictions on Australia, how will it impact our economy, Warren? Yeah, look, it's, it's going to have impacts, but they're all pretty small. Um, it's more the longer term concern about a deteriorating trade relationship. Um, and obviously the big, the big one is, is, is iron ore. Um, and that's our big earner from China. Um, the only thing, and the, uh, the, I don't think we should panic on this. Uh, I certainly don't think, you know, we need to sort of, you know, toss in our values around what, what, you know, what we think of around what China's done or doing. Um, and from an economic point of view, and you're starting to see the government talk about this a little bit more, Australia is an iron ore superpower. Um, Brazil's in a huge amount of trouble. They're the main sort of international alternative to Australia. And if China wants iron ore, they have to come to us. So I think we're, we're sort of, you know, it's a two-way relationship on that front. Um, they're, they're, they're targeting in on small things, and they may continue to. Um, what I would basically... My view on this, the, my assessment of this is that the China situation is deteriorating um, in a whole range of different aspects, um, you know, particularly the US-China relationship, and we are unfortunately going to be part of that toing and froing, and it will do some, some damage to us if they continue to behave like they have by putting these restrictions on. But they won't derail the economy. The other forces I'm talking about are much bigger. Um, the real issue with China is, as it plays out, if it continues to play out, is, is whether it impedes investment. Um, that's the big one. And, and whether or not we, you know, we're starting to see more money flying into mining investment and so forth, and that might be pulled. And, and again, that's a, a case for a, a sort of a weaker outcome for the economy later in the year or in 2021. Yeah, so that's not a, that's the big negative in my view. Thank you, Warren. And I'll leave your microphone on, but a question for Talis by Ben. Uh, does the 13% rebound in stock prices due to Fed purchasing also account for generally improved market sentiment for investors? Or is it just due to the Fed inflating equity prices through expanding their balance sheet? And this relates to another question. What can stop the Fed's money printer? So very good questions. Um, the 13% that I'm estimating is uh, a direct impact of an unanticipated shock to the Fed's balance sheet uh, not to the full $3 trillion, but the first initial shock that signaled there's going to be further uh, balance sheet expansion. So I'm modeling uh, the effects of that particular shock directly as opposed to sentiment and, and other factors. I think the fact that we get about a third of the, or a little bit over a third of the stock market uh, rebound being explained by the Fed's actions leaves another two thirds to be explained by factors such as sentiment, uh, you know, excessive optimism, uh, rebalancing by funds, inflows from passive funds and so forth. So I think there's room for those other factors as well. But what I've been modeling is the direct effect of the Fed. Great. Thank you, Talis. And uh, another question probably for both of you. Why has Australia's rebound been more subdued than the US, than in the US? Is it due to the relative stimulus of the Australian government being less? And maybe Talis, you can start and Warren can take it away then after. Okay, so for me to start, I would say that the, centri the Fed's re response has been sharper and more aggressive uh, than the RBA's response. So that's one of the factors um, that has led to, uh, I think, a stronger rebound in, in the US markets. Uh, another factor that's relevant, I think, is perhaps uh, one of the questions that was raised earlier about the high degree of concentration in the US stock market. A lot of that rebound in the US stock market isn't driven by the small stocks is driven by those sort of tech heavy, huge stocks. Uh, and that is a compositional difference from the US market compared to the Australian market. And Warren, uh, what is your view on this question? Yeah, look, I, didn't, I, was, I wasn't able to hear Talis' response, but I, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I, I think the two key ones are more about the US. That is the Fed's, you know, really broad program of asset purchases that they're essentially buying um, all forms of corporate debt, which of course the RBA is not going or has said that they won't do. Um, so putting aside the, sort of the economic implications of that, that by itself will be pushing uh, real money investors, uh, pension funds, insurance companies out of the corporate credit space and into the equity space, particularly given that cash is, is so low in terms of its return. 
so there's a, a portfolio slash flow effect in there. And then the other one I think that's worth bearing in mind is the fact that the, the NASDAQ's done so well. And this, this is a pre-existing problem our world faces, but the, the massive pooling of, of economic surplus or profits or revenues or whatever in, the, in a few globally dominant technology companies. And, of course, the the, the, um, the shock is, 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 you know, one sort of positive view the investment community is taking of this shock is that it's going to fast track a lot of these digital channels and, 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 and that's helped those, you know, you know, what they once called frames. I think there's a new word for it now. So I think it's the technology piece and I think it's the Fed is the big difference. Um, and I think there's less um, sort of, you know, exuberance in the Australian market. But the, the differences aren't huge. I mean, you know, there's, there's still the, the overall price dynamic in the market, the bounce is, is, is more prominent than the differential. Thank you, Warren. And we, we start with you now for the next couple of questions. Um, question by Ryan and another attendee. Under which conditions uh, stock markets will catch up with the economic reality? And a related question is, is there an implied time frame for a correction reduction in share markets? And this is now the crystal ball questions that Tal is not going to answer, but maybe he will do after you anyways. Yeah. So, look, I think what we're seeing is that the equity market... Um, obviously it was in a position of extreme stress in March. So you could argue that it, it sold down too much. So the first part of the bounce um, was really just a correction. Um, Kylie uh, and Richard has done some work um, and published a paper on this about how dysfunctional the markets were. So I think you've, you've got part of the rebound um, that we've seen was uh, just market dynamics. Um, now, you know, the market is now essentially for the last six weeks or so, I think pricing in the snapback, um, we're definitely seeing it now play out in Australia. Um, I think it's a bit of hope when it comes to places like America and Europe, but you know, you are starting to see the easing of restrictions there despite their much more severe health point of view. So the way I'd be thinking about it is the market is sort of riding the, the early stages of a V and extrapolating it forward, re you know, in you know, a really you know, consistent, stable way right through into 2021. I think the market is very vulnerable to the idea that the economy either doesn't snap back as strongly uh, in Australia that we get the W, or that you know the bounce in places like the US or Europe is is, is softer um, than than you know implied by current markets. In which case, the market will tend to. I think the market will tend to move a little bit ahead of the economic reality. And uh, I think the, the, the next sort of re-weight rating of the market downwards, if indeed that turns out to be the right sort of view, I mean, we could all be wrong. The market might, you know, the economy might continue to go from strength to strength. I mean, we'd hope, like to think so. I just think we're uh, dubious of that as a likely outcome. But I think if, if it plays out like we suspect and there's a sort of, you know, weakness in the second half of the economy that the market's not pricing, it can re-rate at any time. Um, so any time in the next, you know, in the next, you know, four to eight weeks, could happen in the next week. I mean, it's rolling strongly now, and often markets are, are basically the weakest is when they look their strongest. And that old sort of investment saying. Thank you, Warren. And tell us, do you have a view on the uh, on the time frame coming up? Yes. If I go back to the sort of the three drivers, the three main forces, I think that are propping up markets at the moment. You've got the uh, excessive optimism or sort of unjustified optimism that comes from underestimating risk. That's an effect where perceptions catch up with reality. And as they do, that's going to put downward pressure on valuations as people who ask for bigger discount rates in this time of high uncertainty. It's also going to come back down as more data comes out that, uh, like, for example, uh, corporate earnings that give people a reality check and bring expectations more in line with, uh, with fundamentals. The second driver was uh, funds that have, um, you know, propping up the, the market through inflows into passive funds and outflows from active funds and rebalancing by 60-40 portfolios. Uh, that's an effect that's likely to dissipate with time as people need money because of economic uh, conditions, uh, worse things. So the, the macroeconomics will drive a pullback there is my view. So two of those factors are going to generally put downward pressure on the stock market over the coming uh, sort of near term. The third one, central bank intervention, I don't see central banks stepping away from, from markets anytime soon or reducing the amount of stimulus they're willing to throw at markets. So I think it's going to be a tension between central banks trying to keep markets stable 
or uh, uh, versus these other sort of downward effects on, on the markets. It's going to be a real tension that's going to play out over the coming months. So I think volatility is certainly one thing we'll see. Thank you very much, Talis. And given the technical problems, I will uh, just ask two very brief questions and ask for very brief answers. And the first question is only for Warren. Um, and Maxlin said, I noticed a point regarding the data from Q1 was not affecting equity markets. Do you expect company reports from Q2 to largely influence the market down the track? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't know for sure, but certainly a, a characteristic of the market in the last six weeks has been that, you know, Q1 reporting, and I'm mainly thinking about the US here, um, but it's the same in Australia. But Q1 reporting, you know, the, the virus shutdown impacts were really at late in the in the quarter, um, very late in Australia's case. Um, and, you know, the Q1 numbers weren't all that affected, really, um, whether it's economic data or company reports. So we're really looking at Q2, um, and the, the, we're waiting on, obviously, Q2 reports, and they're not going to come through. But the key thing was guidance has been suspended um, by most companies. So you sort of, you know, the market's not operating with its normal information set, and... I think the other point I put in there is that, you know, when there's a lot of liquidity around and, you know, people are just naturally buying, when there's flow buying, so when the market, if, it, if nothing else is happening, the market will tend to rally. I think that really, you know, gives the market an exuberant feel um, and that can actually be self-fulfilling to some extent. So with no guidance and no sort of real sort of earnings insight that this is how severe this is, the market is tending to sort of go with the flow, so to speak, and the flow right now is um, to buy because of what the Fed's doing, and also because a lot of investors cashed up in March, part of the reason the market fell so far was a lot of investors got out of stocks and in the, in the cash, and, and now they've got money to, to put back to work, potentially. Thank you, Warren, and a final question for Talis. With significant volumes going through in markets, will the market's infrastructure start to wilt under the pressure? Or uh, are the volumes threatening the stability of the entire market or markets globally? Uh, so the volumes have been huge and we have seen a number of markets struggling to keep up with the volumes. We still have, I mean, the US just finished over the couple of weekends, having people work on weekends to clear the backlog of failed trades uh, that happened during the peak volatility in, in March and uh, in March and, and a little bit into April as well. We also saw Australian uh, clearing and settlement facilities struggling to cope with the volume, which just simply wasn't an anticipated uh, scale. Um, but subsequently, I think these the market infrastructure uh, will be ramped up uh, to deal with these types of volumes going through in the future. So. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll see sort of um, better infrastructure, more able to cope uh, with these types of volumes. The other thing when it comes to volumes, there's been uh, people sort of were concerned about going into the crisis was how would ETFs be able to deal with these huge amounts of uh, flows and volatility in the underlying. It seems that equity ETFs have held up reasonably well in the face of these large volumes. Bond ETFs, a little bit more sort of uh, difficulties there driven largely by the illiquidity of the underlying asset, the fixed income uh, security. So bigger price disconnections there. Thank you very much, Talis. And in the interest of time, we are closing our webinar. We would like to thank all attendees, more than 100 today online, and also our uh, panelists and presenters, Professors Warren Hogan and Talis Putnins. And we look forward to seeing you in the future at a, at a UTS finance event to explore more about COVID-19 and the economy. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.